Uh, I'm very pleased to be joining you uh, virtually from uh, uh, on the other side of the, the world. And uh, now I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, now let's... Okay, so now I hope that you're seeing on full screen uh, my title slide and your college's uh, logo. Is that is that correct? Yes, sir. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about a new measure, the revolutionary reform of the metric system. And as you see, I'm from uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is the uh, National Metrology Laboratory of the United States. It's uh, equivalent to your National Physical Laboratory, your NPL. Uh, so the metric system began uh, around the time of the French Revolution. And one of the dreams of the French revolutionaries was to create a system of units that would be uh, usable for all time and for all people. At that time, there were a wide variety of systems and measurements. Often every village would have its own standard of length. And uh, the uh, merchants would come to the town square and use the standard of length that was uh, built into the wall of the, of the town square. But if you went to another town, you would have a different standard of length. Well, the, the revolutionaries believed that uh, they would... Um, want to have a standard that would be good for all times and for all people. And this medal that you see uh, illustrates the, the idea of uh, what they considered to be the measure of all things. The meter, the new standard of length, was to be based on the uh, size of the earth. And here in this cartoon, you see that uh, the idea was that, that the distance between the North Pole and the equator was defined to be 10,000 kilometers, which is to say 10 million meters. So that was the definition of the meter. And the definition of a kilogram was that you took one liter of water, and one liter is derived from the definition of the meter. It's a, uh, a cube that is one-tenth of a meter on each side, and uh, filled with water, that was the definition of one kilogram. And of course, the second uh, is simply the appropriate fraction of one day. And in this way, they had uh, the meter kilogram second system that uh, uh, became our modern metric system. And some people still refer to this as the MKS system for meter, kilogram, and second. But there was a problem. It wasn't easy at all to make this measurement of how far the distance was from the pole to the, uh, to the equator, and in fact, a much smaller segment uh, was measured in the years uh, around the French Revolution, and then this was extrapolated to the entire distance to produce what the, uh, uh, the de original definition of the meter was. Unfortunately, it was so difficult to do that people decided that instead they would define the meter to be uh, uh, based on an artifact standard. And uh, late in the 19th century, they created uh, what it was called the International Prototype of the Meter. It was a metal bar with scratches on it uh, that were one meter apart. Now, that was much more convenient than uh, going out and measuring the, uh, the size of the Earth. But the problem was that... Uh, the difficulty of determining where the center of a scratch was had become significant enough that by the time this meter bar was made, there were other methods for measuring length using the wavelength of light. And here's a picture of, uh, uh, of a scientist with an interferometer uh, where if one mirror is moved by just a fraction of a wavelength of light, and a wavelength of light is... Uh, less than one millionth of a meter. If the mirror was moved by a, a, a fraction of that, it would change this interference pattern in a noticeable way. And as a result, people were measuring length 
using uh, the wavelength of light as a kind of de facto standard. It was not the legal standard, but it was so much better than the legal standard that that's what people were using. And that practice continued into the, uh, uh, the 20th century when finally the definition of the meter was changed to be based on the wavelength of light, but it was the wavelength of a lamp, and that lamp was soon uh, supplanted by lasers, which, which made a much more pure light, and, uh, and so people started to use light from lasers as the de facto standard. Uh, again, even though it was not the legal standard, they used the light from a laser like this as the de facto standard. And uh, finally, uh, it was decided that they had to redefine the meter to make uh, use of the better light that came from a laser. And the obvious thing to do would have been to define the meter in terms of the wavelength of light coming from that laser. But fortunately, there were very uh, forward-looking people at that time, and they decided on a much better definition of the meter, which is described here. In 1983, the meter was defined to be the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during a certain time interval. Now, we had a very good definition of what the second was based on the hyperfine frequency of cesium, so, so there was no ambiguity about what was meant by a second. And this said that a, that a meter was the distance that light traveled in a certain length of time. Because of this universal relationship that the wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency of light, what it meant was that if you could measure the frequency of the light, and now we have effectively defined the speed of light, because you see, if we say that the meter is the length of path traveled by light in a certain length of time, you have defined the speed of light. This number in the denominator is the speed of light in meters per second, by definition. So that meant that if you could measure the frequency of the light, and you have now defined the speed of light, you immediately know its wavelength. So it doesn't matter what laser you use, as long as you can measure its frequency, you have a definition of how long its wavelength is. If someone makes better lasers, if someone improves the method for measuring the frequency of those lasers, the definition is still good. And the ability to use that definition has been made better. And so, if we have better lasers, better techniques, we get a better definition of the meter, but using the same definition. This is getting at the revolutionary dream, something that is good for all time. And in the modern metric system, what we call the International System of Units, or the SI. Today, we now have every one of the base units, the kilogram, the meter, the second, the ampere, the kelvin, the mole, and the candela. Every one of those seven units is now defined in this same beautiful way by defining a constant of nature. Now, why was this necessary? Well, the main motivation for uh, having this reform to the modern metric system was that the kilogram was in really bad shape. You remember that I told you that uh, the revolutionary dream was to define the meter in terms of the, the size of the earth and then define the kilogram in terms of uh, a certain volume of water. Well, they tried that, but they found that defining the kilogram in terms of a certain volume of water really was not a very good definition of the kilogram. And so they came up with another definition of the kilogram, one that is um, uh, very similar to the definition they used for the meter. They made an artifact. They made a piece of metal that was as close as possible to the mass of a liter of water and they called the mass of that piece of metal a kilogram. And this definition, until uh, a little bit more than a year ago, was the definition of the kilogram, that the kilogram is the mass 
of the international prototype of the kilogram, a single piece of metal. Let me show you a picture of it. Uh, this is the, the international prototype of the kilogram. It's protected under three different uh, uh, domes of, of glass. And it was made to match uh, the original artifact kilogram, the kilogram of the archives, which was made in 1799. So the point I want to make is that until a little bit more than a year ago, until May of uh, 2019, the international definition of the kilogram used by the entire world was uh, the mass of an object made in the 19th century based upon an object that had been made in the 18th century. And this sounds so antique, something that is uh, so out of date, it's hard to believe that in the 21st century, we were still using that kind of a definition. And if someone were to handle this, this kilogram with their hands and leave a fingerprint on it, it would change its mass. But by definition, the mass cannot change because the definition of the kilogram is the mass of that very object. <clears throat> and so if someone left a, a fingerprint on this object, it would not change the mass of that object legally. It would instead change the mass of everything else in the universe. Well, that's a completely untenable situation. That's, that's not the sort of situation that we uh, can allow ourselves to have in the modern day. And even though no one uh, leaves a fingerprint on the international prototype of the kilogram, uh, people handle it with great care, it nevertheless appears to be changing. Here is a plot that shows the mass of other nearly identical kilograms numbered uh, according to some scheme that they figured out in the 19th century. This shows the mass of a number of those other, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of those other copies of the kilogram compared to the international prototype of the kilogram. And it appears that all of those kilograms are changing in the same direction. To me, that implies that probably the international prototype of the kilogram is changing. But of course, by definition, the international prototype of the kilogram cannot change. Uh, it's always the same. It's the definition of the kilogram. And so it seems we need something, uh, some new definition of the kilogram. And uh, how are we going to fix this scandalous situation where the mass of our standard uh, of mass appears to be changing? Well, we're going to use the same beautiful approach that we used in redefining the meter. We're going to define a value uh, of a fundamental constant of nature. Now, to understand what constant we're going to use, I first want to remind you of something that you all know, probably the most famous equation in history, E equals mc squared, where E is the total energy of an object at rest, m is its rest mass, and c is the speed of light. So everyone knows this equation. Another equation, which is not quite as famous, is that the energy of a photon, E, is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. Now, if we combine these two equations together and solve for the mass, we find that the mass, which I've said in quotation marks, the, is the mass of a photon that has a frequency f, is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency divided by the speed of light. Now, remember, we have defined the speed of light when we defined what a meter was. It's easy, as it turns out, and I haven't told you why, but it turns out that it's relatively easy to measure the frequency of laser light. So you see that if we define Planck's constant to have a certain fixed value, we will have provided a definition for what the mass of a photon is. Now, when I say the mass of a photon, what I really mean is if I had an object, say some sort of a nucleus, and it emitted a gamma ray, a single photon, 
its mass would change by this amount. Now, that sounds like it might be a good way of defining mass, but it turns out that we can't measure the change in mass of a nucleus that well, and so we have a different way of doing it. So in order to show you, I have a movie. Here is a, uh, uh, a cartoon of how we measure mass uh, ordinarily. If we have an unknown mass here, we put some known masses on this side, and when they balance, we know what the mass of this unknown object. That's the usual way of measuring mass. Now, what I want to indicate is that there is an alternative way that I could imagine measuring mass. Say that on this side of the balance, instead of having a standard mass, I have a coil of wire, and I put that coil of wire in a magnetic field so that that magnetic field exerts a force on that coil of wire to balance the force of gravity from this unknown mass. If I knew exactly how much current I put in this coil, and if I knew exactly the dimensions of this coil, and if I knew exactly what the strength of this magnetic field was, then I could use that to calculate this force, and therefore I would know what the mass of this object was as soon as I measured the local acceleration of gravity. But the problem is, we don't know any of those things. We don't know, well, we can measure the current very well, but we don't know where the wires are. It's too difficult to measure that. And we don't know how to make a magnetic field accurately enough to do this job. So we cannot use this method as an alternative to uh, measuring an unknown mass. But fortunately, uh, a very clever man named Brian Kibble came up with an idea to allow us to do that. What Kibble said was, take this coil and this magnet, and then uh, uh, have uh, electrical leads that you connect to a voltmeter. And now when the coil is moved, you deliberately move the coil and measure how much voltage is created when you move the coil. This is what every generator does. You move wires in the presence of a magnetic field and it generates a voltage. Kibble said, do that and measure what that voltage is and measure the velocity of the coil. So we call this the velocity mode part of the experiment. Now, having done that, it turns out you know enough information that when you do the other part of the experiment, what we call the weighing part of the experiment, where you put uh, current in this coil, measure that current, and then use that uh, force that's generated there to balance your unknown mass, that's the weighing mode. And what Kibble found was that if you take the, uh, the force that you measure, right here, mass times the acceleration of gravity, that's the force that you measure, uh, in the weighing mode, multiply it by the velocity that you have in the velocity mode, that's equal to the product of the current that you get in the weighing mode times the voltage you measure in the velocity mode. You see, this is a force times a velocity. That's mechanical power. And this is current times voltage. That's electrical power. These two things have to be equal. And so that means that if we solve for the mass, we know that the mass that we've got is equal to the current we measure in the weighing mode, the voltage we measure in the velocity mode, divided by the acceleration of gravity and the velocity that we measure in the velocity mode. And that's our new way of defining mass. But remember, I promised you that we were going to do this using Planck's constant. So where does Planck's constant come, come in? It comes in because the way in which we measure the current and the voltage uh, the modern way in which we measure the current and the voltage using the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect uh, due to Klaus uh, uh, von Klitzing and uh, Brian Josephson, those ways of measuring it use Planck's constant. And here I have a picture of myself. Uh, that's me. Here's Brian Josephson who gave us the Josephson effect, which told us that there was a, a relationship between the frequency that I would measure on a volt on a Josephson junction and the voltage across it, it's equal to 2e over h, the 
charge on the electron divided by Planck's constant. And what uh, uh, von Klitzing taught us was that the quantum Hall resistance is equal to Planck's constant divided by the square of the uh, of the electron charge. Now, when we measure the um, the current and the voltage, we we use these these constants. As it turns out, the electrical charge cancels out, and we're left with Planck's constant. And uh, so we've had a redefinition of the kilogram that took effect on the twentieth of May, uh, two thousand and nineteen by defining a value of, of Planck's constant. Uh, so that's how that works for the kilogram. Uh, we've also redefined the ampere by defining the charge on the electron. Remember, the Josephson effect and the, the quantum Hall effect both uh, had uh, definitions of uh, voltage and of resistance that depended upon the electrical charge and Planck's constant. So if we also define the electrical charge, that means we have a new definition of the ampere, and we can use that as our definition of the ohm uh, and the volt as well. So it's extremely convenient to uh, have defined not only H, but also E, so that uh, the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect are now exact in the international system of units. In addition, We've also defined the Kelvin and the mole. It used to be that the Kelvin was a certain fraction of the triple point of water, 1 over 273.16 Kelvins of the, uh, is the defined value of the triple point of water. Now we have redefined the Kelvin as of May 20th of 2019 by defining the value of the Boltzmann constant. And, and finally, the mole. It used to be that the mole was equal to uh, the amount of substance that had a number of entities, say atoms or molecules, that was equal to the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. That's no longer the definition of the mole. The new definition of the mole fixes what Avogadro's number is. So the mole is simply the amount of quantity that has a certain fixed number it's, that we call Avogadro's number of elementary entities. So now all of the uh, of the units, well, the, the, the meter and the, the second have long been defined in terms of fundamental constants. The meter in, by defining the speed of light, the second by defining the uh, 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 hyperfine frequency of cesium. So now all the units have been defined in terms of natural constants. And so uh, I want to play for you a movie uh, of the international conference that that adopted legally that adopted this and i think uh, you'll find this quite interesting it took more than 140 years groundbreaking science and the agreement from the world scientific community at times it seemed impossible accurate precise measurements anytime anywhere Thanks. We did it. We have a special. No, no, they are. Lacey Aboni. One of them. This is my robot. Proud of die. This is my robot. 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 And so I hope that if you were watching carefully, you uh, saw some people from India's uh, National Physical Laboratory taking part in that, uh, for me, what was a, a very emotional moment. Uh, and so it appears that we have finally realized the revolutionary dream of having a system of units that's good for all time uh, and for all people. Uh, but as it turns out, it's not quite true. It turns out 
that the definition of the second is probably going to change sometime in the relatively near future. Because today, the definition of the second, based on the hyperfine frequency of cesium, is only good to a part in 10 to the 16. Now, you might say, a part in 10 to the 16. How could you ask for anything better than that? In fact, uh, it is the best measured uh, quantity uh, in all of, uh, of nature, is time. We can measure it to, to about a part in 10 to the 16. But today, and I don't want to go into the details, in laboratories uh, I, uh, of NIST, uh, where I work, uh, and in other laboratories around the world, People are measuring frequencies to an accuracy of two orders of magnitude better. And so, with that kind of accuracy, uh, it appears that, uh, uh, that, that we're going to have to change the definition of time, and we expect to be doing that probably sometime in around the next 10 or 20 years. But even then, it probably won't be something that will be good for all time. And so, we haven't quite gotten to the point of having something that's good for all time and for all people. And the thing that's the problem is time itself. So, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'll be very happy to take your questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar has a question for you. He asks, why is current taken as the fundamental quantity, quanti quantity and not electric charge? Yes. Well, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, in a sense, it was simply uh, a choice that was made as a matter of convenience. When uh, the international system of units was being put into practice, the question was, how shall we introduce the electrical units? into the, uh, the, the system. And uh, the question was, should it be charge or should it be current? And it turns out that it's easier to measure the forces between current carrying wires than it is to measure the force between uh, charged uh, uh, metal objects, let's say capacitor plates. So even though it's quite hard to measure the force between current carrying wires, it's easier to do that than it is to measure the force between uh, charged uh, uh, conductors. And so the original definition of the ampere was that the ampere is that current which, when put through two infinitely long wires of negligible cross-section, one meter apart, will produce a force of two times 10 to the minus seven newtons per meter of length. That's the old definition of the, of the ampere, the one that most of you grew up with. Uh, that had the effect of defining what we call mu naught, the magnetic permeability of free space. The new definition uh, of the ampere defines uh, uh, the charge. So in a sense, we've gone, we've changed. We now define charge. In the old system, we define current. And Again, it's a matter of convenience. Given the ability to measure the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect, it's easier to define current using a definition of charge. So uh, when we were making this re revision of the, of the fundamental constants, some people thought it would be better to make the base unit, the Coulomb, instead of the ampere. And that was seriously discussed, that we would change the system of units so that the Coulomb became this, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the base unit, uh, and we defined the Coulomb in terms of the charge of the electron. But it was decided to stick with the old uh, uh, set of units because it would be less disruptive to, uh, to the measurement system as a whole. But again, it wasn't really so much a, uh, a choice that was imposed by the basic science. It was a choice that was made for convenience. Thank you, sir.
The next question is from Mr. Nityananda Das. He says, in one slide, you used the term rest mass. So he oh, has yes. a question. Does mass change with velocity or is it the momentum which changes with velocity, not mass? <laughs> well, okay. So this has been a, a question that um, uh, people have argued about uh, for many years. And when I was young, when I was your age, we, we said that mass changed with velocity. And we specified rest mass, and then we specified uh, something like total mass. And the total mass of an object was said to be equal to the rest mass divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, you know, the usual relativistic transformation. Today, uh, it is considered um, old-fashioned to say that. Today, we say that an object has a mass, and that mass is always the same, and that mass is what we used to call the rest mass. And there are different rules for determining what the momentum of that object is um, relativistically. So the answer to your question is very similar to the answer to the previous question. It's a choice that we've made to talk about things in a certain way. And uh, I think that the modern choice is a better one. Because the trouble with saying that, that the mass is this mass that uh, uh, the, the object acquires as it, uh, uh, it corresponds to its total energy, it's, it's rest mass energy, it's rest energy plus its kinetic energy, you might say you divide that by c squared and you get the total, the total mass. The trouble with that is that that mass doesn't have a simple... Um, scalar uh, manifestation. That is, if you ask how gravity works on that mass in general relativity, then you get different answers depending on which direction you're looking. And so to avoid that kind of complication, we say that the mass is the rest mass, and that's a scalar. And then uh, we just have to have the correct rules for both special and general relativity to see how an object responds to gravity or to other forces uh, when it's moving uh, relative to your frame of reference. So <laughs> it's a very good question, but the answer is kind of complicated, as you see. <laughs> so the next question is from Ms. Archita Das. She asks, are the atomic clocks expected to bring about any revolutionary change in the time measurement? And the answer is yes. And uh, it's what I was alluding to very quickly at the end of my talk, and I am apologize for the fact that I didn't have time, time, I didn't have time to tell you about time uh, in detail. So, um, so let me say just a few more words about that. Today, the definition of the second is based on a defined value for the hyperfine frequency of cesium. So you go to the electronic ground state of cesium, you ask for the frequency that's required to change the nuclear spin pointing this way and the electron spin pointing this way to having it flipped over. That's what we call the hyperfine frequency. And that's defined to be some number which is 9.18 something gigahertz, okay? And it's, you know, has many digits. That's the current definition of the second. And by using atomic clocks to measure uh, that hyperfine frequency, or I should say to see, uh, to match the frequency of some oscillator to the, the atomic frequency, we, that's how we realize the second. That's how we, uh, how we make these devices called atomic clocks. And we believe that they correctly get the frequency of the hyperfine uh, separation in cesium, we believe that they get it correctly to a few parts in 10 to the 16. Now that's a microwave frequency, 9 gigahertz. But there are transitions in atoms that are at much higher frequencies, at optical frequencies, for example, at about 10 to the 5 hertz, so about 100,000 times higher frequency. And because the frequency is higher, we can make more accurate measurements of those frequencies if we uh, make atomic clocks 
that operate on, on those transitions. And that's what we do today. Using lasers, very highly stable lasers, we can induce transitions uh, that are at frequencies on the order of 10 to 15 hertz. And these atomic clocks uh, correctly get that frequency to something like a few parts in 10 to the 18, or even uh, 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 parts in 10 to the 19. And the hyperfine clocks cannot do that, cannot come close to that. So if we want to have a definition of time that makes use of the best technology, we're going to have to change the definition of the second. So sometime in the future, the definition of the second is going to be changed to define the frequency of some transition in some atom. I'm guessing it's going to be strontium, and it'll be the transition to the uh, triplet uh, uh, P state uh, uh, with zero uh, total angular momentum, the, the, the triplet P naught, as we say. I'm guessing that will be the answer, but we don't know because there's really excellent transitions in terbium and in aluminum ions and in terbium ions. Uh, and so we have to find out which one works best. And some, when the international community agrees, and that always takes a long time to get everybody in the world to agree <laughs> that we should make this change. Uh, when the international uh, community agrees, then we will change the definition. I'm guessing between 10 and 20 years from Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question is uh, by uh, Mr. Riju Isaac. He asks, how do you measure time as short as 10 raised to minus 19 seconds? And what will be the error bar? Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good question. I'm really glad that you asked that. Because it's not uh, time that we measure at the level of 10 to the minus 19 seconds. What we measure is frequency and we take not just seconds but days and sometimes months to measure the frequency so uh we might say make two atomic clocks and we stabilize each atomic clock to some atomic transition and then we compare the frequency of the two atomic clocks to see how uh, stable they are relative to each other we might take months or even years to do that, and that's where we get the uh, parts in 10 to the 19. We don't measure 10 to the minus 19 seconds. We measure one part in 10 to the 19 of a frequency. Actually, we don't do that yet. We measure nine parts in 10 to the 19 of a frequency, about one part in 10 to the 18 of a frequency, but we measure it over weeks or, or even months. So the next question is, is it possible to standardize length or time in relativistic point of view? Um, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> the question says, is it possible to standardize length or time in a relativistic point of view? That's how the question has been worded. I could ask the person to reword the question once more, I guess. Okay, I think I understand. Okay. Uh, relativity, uh, both special and general relativity, tells us that time is particular to the reference frame in which we are. So in special relativity, we, um, we know that time uh, runs differently in different inertial frames. And in general relativity, we know that time uh, changes uh, depending upon the gravitational potential. So what I'm guessing the question is, how do we deal with that issue of reference frame uh, uh, with time? Is that, is, is, is that the way you would interpret the question? Okay, and, and, and it's a very good question, and it exposes a tremendous weakness in our definition of time. So from a point of view of special relativity, it's not a very difficult thing. The time is defined as proper time. That is, it's the time in the reference frame in which we're working. And it's easy to see that uh, uh, time in another reference frame is, uh, is different. For example, uh, if I have two cesium clocks, 
and I keep one in the laboratory and I send the other one on a trip uh, in an airplane around the world back when we used to travel by plane <laughs> around the world before the pandemic, uh, then when you bring that clock back, you will find that the time is different from the clock that uh, uh, stayed in the laboratory. This is sometimes called the twin paradox. It's not a paradox. We understand very well why and how it works. Uh, but our definition of time is means in your frame. Whatever frame you're in, that's what the definition of time is. Well, that's good for special relativity. Things are harder for general relativity. So by law, by international agreement, the definition of time is the hyperfine frequency when measured at the altitude or at the, at the gravitational potential that corresponds to the average sea level for the world. So there is a surface uh, that is a gravitational equipotential that corresponds to this mean sea level. And that is the position at which we define time. Now, it turns out that's not really the best definition. You've probably heard that there are things called pulsars that give pulses of radio waves from distant rotating neutron stars or from uh, sometimes binaries. Uh, and these things pulse uh, in an extremely regular way. And in fact, it was our first indication that there were such a thing as gravity waves because they slow down a little bit. That is the binaries, the ones that are rotating like this, slow down a little bit as they radiate gravity waves and we can measure that slowing. But if you want to measure that slowing, you'd better not use the reference frame that I just described. Because when the Earth changes its distance to the sun during the course of a year, or when Jupiter in its orbit changes its distance to the Earth, it changes the frequency of atomic clocks that are at the Earth reference frame. And since the pulsars are way outside of uh, our galaxies, uh, then uh, they have nothing to do with our solar system's reference frame, or I should say our Earth's reference frame. And so uh, if we use the Earth's reference frame, it's not good for the pulsars. So the people who study pulsars make a correction to the ticking rate of the clocks as if the clocks were at the center of mass of the solar system. And because we know where all the planets are and what their orbits are and what the masses of the planets are, we can make that correction almost perfectly, but not quite. So, so your question has exposed a real weakness in our definition of time. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is, how is luminosity measured and what is its associated fundamental constant? Yes, okay, so you're asking great questions, and these questions are exposing the weaknesses <laughs> of the things I've been telling you about. So, the, uh, for me, I'm afraid that the candela uh, uh, is one of the, the most embarrassing of our, uh, of our units, because the candela is an attempt to express how bright something appears to the human eye. And since any particular person may be different from other people, this doesn't seem like something that should be part of uh, a system of units where everything else is based on, uh, on constants of nature. We are pretending, we are imagining that the conversion between optical power at a certain wavelength and the eye's perception of how bright that is, we're pretending that that is a constant of nature. Of course, it's not a constant of nature. It's something that varies from one individual to the next, but it turns out that it varies little enough that it's useful to have this for uh, the ability of you to go to the store to buy a light bulb, and uh, it says on the light bulb how many lumens 
it, it uh, puts out. And you will understand how bright that's going to be. And it's not going to be too different for how bright it is for you and how bright it is for your friends. It turns out they've looked at people's reactions all over the world, and it's pretty much the same. So that's why we say that it's a constant of nature. It's not really. But the way we, we treat it today is we say that a certain amount of intensity of light uh, in watts per square meter uh, uh, at a certain wavelength, because of course the human eye uh, has a different sensitivity for different wavelengths, we say that that constitutes a certain uh, 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 luminance uh, value, uh, which means a certain brightness, and it, it's a fiction. I wish that it were not a, uh, a base unit of the SI, but, uh, but people who work in, in illumination are happy that it is. So. Uh, again, it's one of those things that has been done for convenience and for social reasons. Okay, sir. Thank you. Mr. Abhinav Sujish uh, tells you that you said that time appears to be one quantity that defies timeless definition. Yes. But isn't there a time limit for accuracy according to uncertainty principle? So will time also have a permanent definition once we have achieved that max possible accuracy according to the uncertainty principle okay so the answer is that that in almost um, uh, uh, in almost every case of measuring time in the laboratory we already are at the uncertainty principle limit the uh, only when we uh, go to longer and longer times, which allows us to have better and better frequency, do we finally reach a point where other things other than the uncertainty principle start to limit our ability? So, uh, uh, so the question is, what are those limits? And that's exactly the, the, uh, uh, the question that, that determines uh, this, this problem of, of permanence of the definition of time. So let me be a little bit more explicit. Let's say that I have a cesium clock, uh, and I have worked very hard to make all of the, um, what we might call the technical uh, errors of that clock as small as possible. Then I will find that as I wait a longer and longer time, the quality of my time measurement gets better and better. And I go for, I don't know what the number is, but let's say a few weeks today. And it keeps getting better. And then after a few weeks, it stops getting better, at least it doesn't get better as fast as it should. That means that I'm no longer being limited by the uncertainty principle, I'm being limited by something else, like the collisions between the cesium atoms shift the frequency. And if I don't know exactly what the density of the cesium atoms is, and what their temperature is, then I don't know how fast these collisions are occurring, and I can't make a correction for it. That's one of the, the possibilities. Another possibility is that I don't know what the temperature of the laboratory is. And the black body radiation from the, the laboratory is shining on my cesium atoms and shifting the frequency, and I can't make a correction for that. These are the kinds of things we worry about. And so we go to a different atom where uh, these errors are similar, but the frequency is higher, so it's a smaller um, uh, fractional problem. And then I find I can do even better. And then I finally get to the point where I can't do better because these atoms are also having the same kinds of problems. And, uh, and then I say, okay, uh, let me find something else, a nucleus that has a gamma ray transition. And because it's a nucleus, it doesn't have the same kinds of issues that the atoms have, but it will have its own kind of issues. Now, no one has made a nuclear clock yet, but it's a dream for the future. And so it appears that uh, uh, what will always happen is there will be a point in time, that by waiting long enough, that the uncertainty principle will no longer be the limiting factor, that it will be other things, and then we will want to fix those other things, 
and we will fix those other things by finding another atom or another nucleus that uh, is better and we don't see an end to that uh, at least in the foreseeable future. So that's why I say that um, it doesn't appear that time will ever have a timeless definition. But I could be wrong. It could be that sometime in the uh, 22nd century, someone will uh, make uh, a clock that is so good that we cannot find another one that's better. And then that will be the, uh, the end of that. But, you know, maybe in the 23rd century, somebody finds one that's better. <laughs> so so uh, it doesn't appear that, that, that we can guarantee that time is going to have a timeless definition. So the next question is, uh, why is mole a fundamental quantity? Isn't just a number, Mr. Kevin asked. Yes, and again, it's an excellent question, and it exposes one of the weaknesses of the international system of units. The reason why the mole is one of the base units of the international system of units is because the chemists uh, love moles, and uh, they use moles all the time, and they thought that it ought to be part of the, uh, the base units. And so we made it part of the base units so that it would mean that chemists could say that the thing that they use all the time in chemistry is something that is part of the, uh, uh, the base units of the, of the SI. Many people have said there's no particular reason why we need to have the mole to be a base unit. But having said that, having already said that I didn't see any reason why the candela needed to be the base unit, that means that, that you've heard me say, I would be happy if we only had five base units instead of seven. So now you might ask, what is the minimum number of base units that you need to have? And there's no good answer to that question because the number of base units that we have is a matter of convenience. We added them all so that it would be more convenient for the chemists. Imagine the following possibility. I could have a system of units with only one base unit, and the one I'm going to choose is the second. Now, why do I do that? Because it's easy for me to measure distance uh, using time once I've defined the speed of light. So, for example, I could say that uh, this distance is uh, a nanosecond because light travels about 30 centimeters in one nanosecond. So now I have length, but I didn't have to have a new name for things. I'm just going to call this length a nanosecond. Okay? And you're used to this. We have things called light years, right? It's not particularly convenient to measure things in nanoseconds, but we could if we wanted to. In the same way, instead of having a definition of mass, I could just use frequency. I could say the mass of this object is 10 to the 40th hertz. And that would be, I don't even know what that is. But, but uh, obviously it's an amount of energy. And once we've defined what the speed of light is, then we don't need to, uh, 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 to have a separate definition of mass. I just say frequency. But that wouldn't be very convenient. Nobody wants to measure the, the mass of, of objects in, in, uh, in hertz. Uh, and, for example, the same would be true of temperature. You could define the temperature in hertz because it's just an energy, right? Temperature is just a measure of energy. But you don't want to say, oh, I think that I'm going to need a sweater today because it's a certain number of hertz outside. It would just be inconvenient. So the number of base units that we have is a choice we make for convenience. And we've added them all for the convenience of the chemists. And we've added the candela for the convenience of the, uh, the people who, who do uh, luminous uh, uh, intensity, uh, the, the lighting uh, industry. So, so it's a matter of convenience. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir.
and you had agreed for 15 minutes of uh, interaction it has well crossed it is close to 30 minutes now would you be bothered with some more questions or shall we wind up the session no i'm happy to answer more questions okay so the next question is will it ever be possible to standardize every fundamental unit on a single factor uh ah, well okay i think that i've already answered that with my previous answer yes sir so in principle if you didn't worry about convenience then you'd be able to say let's define the second and that's all we need to do okay. and then all the other constants are one <laughs> So uh so people do this routinely when they use what they sometimes call natural units or atomic units uh uh you know uh, you've heard people say the mass of a certain particle is a certain uh, number of GeV over C they're using the electron volt as a uh, as as a standard it's not a particularly convenient one but it's it's common in the high energy uh community so uh so yes it's possible but it's not convenient so i would like to give the mic to uh, dr sarita because we have some, one or two questions in the youtube streaming as well so okay. we'll be taking two questions from the youtube over to dr sarita hello Yes. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, we have only one or two questions on the YouTube streaming. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, from uh, Mr. A. Varadarajan. Uh, he is asking your comment on uh, a statement: changing from one base to another, we increase the accuracy. The measurement system has a natural error, which we cannot avoid. you have comment on this okay so um uh let's take as an example the um uh the definition of of the ampere so the old definition of the ampere and by old i mean you know uh 2 years ago <laughs> the old def def definition of the ampere was based on forces between wires and there was a certain um uh uncertainty associated with measuring those forces uh and that most of that uncertainty had to do with measuring the the distance between the wires uh actually the distance between where the current was in the wires because um it is hard to know where the current is in the wire so this represented a fundamental uncertainty which we kept working on but was really difficult to improve uh dramatically and now the new definition of current is a certain number of electrons per second and it turns out it's much easier to measure that by using a combination of the josephson effect and the quantum hall effect so in this we uh we put current through a resistor we measure that resistance in using the quantum hall effect we measure the voltage across the resistor it induces an effect and that's how we measure current and we can do that much better than the old definition but this new definition still has its fundamental uncertainties whenever i measure a voltage i have to be very careful about uh thermoelectric effects so i have ways of getting rid of thermoelectric effects but they're not perfect um uh in in the case of the uh of the quantum hall effect i have a similar thing i have to measure uh a uh, contact uh resistances and i have ways of getting rid of measuring contact resistances but again uh there's limits to how well i can do this so each of these things has has limits they typically are not fundamental limits usually if we work really hard we can make those things smaller but what happened with the old definition of the ampere was we were working really hard and we were not making progress very fast and so we changed the definition to something where we already had uh, uh improved the techniques beyond what we could do with the old definition of the ampere and now we have a new set of things that uh that limit our our ability um and uh uh and 
the thing that I like about the new definition is that if we come up with a new technology, let's say we learn how to count electrons. That sounds like a really good way of measuring current. But today, we can't count them accurately enough. We miss a few, okay? But let's say that we do better so that we can count electrons perfectly uh, uh, to a level of a part in 10 to the 10. Then we would uh, use that as our way of measuring current. But the beauty is we don't have to change the definition. And that's what's so wonderful about the new set of definitions, that if we have better technology, we can still use the old definition. And my point is that I believe that's now true for all of the, uh, the units of measure except for time. That new technology is going to require a new definition for time, but new technology will not require a new definition for current or for mass uh, or for uh, uh, temperature. Uh, these new definitions should be good for all time. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there will be some technology that's better that doesn't use the current definition. And then we'll probably change the definition again. But I, I'm, not, I'm not anticipating that that's going to happen. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is uh, uh, Bridget Vinod. She's asking, uh, does length contraction influence the determination of unit length? Yeah, Do we okay. any errors when we define the unit length? Yeah, okay, so this, this is a, a question having to do with special relativity, uh, and it's very similar to the previous question about time. And the answer is that these definitions, length and time, are in the rest frame of the observer. So uh, we understand very well that if we measure length in a different uh, inertial frame from the one in which we're, we're working, we're going to get a different answer. So, so the, the, the definition is in the reference frame of the observer. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we have only one more question. Uh, uh, Shyam Krishna then asked, uh, sir, are you trying to make conclusion? We will not be reaching a point of perfection, that is 100% for the accuracy of measurement for any quality quality and quantity because of all the error due to each of the surrounding factors. Yeah. Okay, so I think I've understood the question. The question is, is there anything that we can measure with no uh, uncertainty? That is, can we ever achieve perfect accuracy? And I think the answer to that is no. Uh, there's always some, uh, uh, some source of uncertainty. Uh, typically, it's what we would call a, uh, a technical error a, or a technical uncertainty, something that has to do with the, the technology of what we're measuring. Sometimes, uh, if you, uh, uh, under the right circumstances, it's the quantum uncertainty principle. But there's always something. So, uh, as I mentioned, the thing about the uncertainty principle is for time, for example, if we stay with short enough times, the uncertainty principle will dominate. Uh, if we go to long enough times when the uncertainty principle becomes uh, a small enough contribution, then other things will dominate. It's always going to be like that. Uh, I don't anticipate that there is any physical quantity that we can measure exactly, except, say, counting. You know, like... Uh, if I, uh, even counting has a problem. Uh, let's say I want to ask how many electrons I have on a, uh, uh, on a certain uh, superconducting island, or let's say how many atoms do I have uh, of a certain kind on a surface. Well, I can look at them and count them, and then that sounds like I've done it perfectly. The trouble with that is that almost always the fact of looking at them disturbs it. And uh, there may be a very small probability that looking at the atoms will release them and, uh, and make them go away, uh, but it's, it's typically non-zero. Uh, 
So even counting things may have an uncertainty because the act of counting can, with some low probability, uh, destroy the thing that I'm counting. Uh, now, that usually isn't, isn't a problem when we're counting uh, things like, uh, well, let's say I was counting coins. There's the probability that in the process of counting I lose one is very small, right? <laughs> So, so there's something where I think I have perfect accuracy. For all practical purposes, I have perfect accuracy. But counting electrons, not so much. So the next question is from Mr. Ali. He has a doubt on the standardized unit of magnet flux, that is Weber. He says that magnetic flux is the number of lines of magnetic force passing through a given area normally. It is merely a number, he asks. So why is it a unit called Weber assigned to magnetic flux? Well, again, um, uh, first of all, <clears throat> remember the Weber is not one of the base units. It's what we call a derived unit. And uh, I have to admit, I don't use Weber's very much. <laughs> <laughs> I use I use Tesla, but uh, Weber. If I'm remembering correctly, a Weber is a uh, uh, is a Tesla meter squared or something like that. Uh, and uh, obviously, it's it's useful to have uh, a unit of flux. I don't remember when the Weber was named, but there was a time when we didn't have a name for the Weber. And in my lifetime, I believe, uh, they decided to call a, a Tesla meter squared, if that's what the, the definition of a Weber is, they decided to call it a Weber because there was a movement to, to name a lot of these quantities that, uh, that people um, uh, had. Well, the Tesla, again, is something that's, that's relatively recent as a name for, uh, uh, for something. So. Uh, so, so, so the answer to the question is, I guess, yes, it is just a name. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a name that's chosen so as to make life a little bit easier. Uh, so uh, uh, if, uh, if we didn't have a name for, for, for Weber, then people who are constantly dealing with flux would always have to say Tesla meter squared. And it would just uh, be a little bit less convenient. So I think that, that giving names to these things uh, is just a matter of convenience. But we don't give names to everything. For example, one of the most common quantities that we encounter in the physical world is velocity. And we measure velocity in meters per second. We don't have a special name for one meter per second, the way we do for a Weber or a Tesla. So. Uh, I think that, again, it's a matter of, of choice for convenience and also perhaps a matter of history and sociology, what things we have decided to give uh, names to. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question, sir. The question is, which quantity should be given importance in any measurement? E mm -hmm. or D in electric measurement, or uh, well, D or H in magnetic measurement. Okay, well, <laughs> again, this is something that people have been arguing about for uh, for a long time, and and I guess that it is um, a matter of taste. Uh, if you're in vacuum, of course, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, I would say that, that certainly when, when you're in vacuum, uh, the matter, the, the question of whether you should use E or D or whether you should H or, or B uh, is totally a matter of convenience. When you're in materials, then things become a little bit more uh, uh, difficult because you're, you know, B compared to H has to do with whether or not you're including the polarization field, the same way with E compared to D. And I don't think there's any, any easy answer to the question. I think that the, um, uh, the kind of problem that you're doing will dictate which of these quantities is the most convenient one to use. 
I think the key thing that one has to remember is to be careful, to realize that uh, there are both of these quantities and they're both important and you'd better make sure that you've taken into account in the correct way the, the polarization. People are still arguing about how to calculate certain kinds of things depending upon uh, how you deal with fields in, uh, in materials. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is that I'm aware of arguments. Not, these aren't things that I'm myself participating in, but people are arguing about how to calculate certain features and argue about whether the right thing to use is E or B, whether or E or D or, 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 or B or H, uh, and have not yet come up with definitive answers. So the question you're asking is one that in some cases is still unresolved, even for the question of asking what should be an unambiguous question, what is the result of a particular measurement going to be? Uh, and so, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Abraham force, but there is a um, uh, a force that is exerted on, uh, on an object when an electromagnetic wave passes through it. And uh, there are a number of different ways of calculating this force. And people have been arguing about it since the beginning of the 20th century, at least, about how to properly calculate this force. And I think that today that it's fairly well agreed how to do it, but it has to do with the fact that you've got the material, you've got the light, and then you have the interaction between the light and the material. And therein lies all the problems, that you have to properly account for the field, the material, and the interaction between the field and the material. And the way in which you do that, uh, well, you have to do it right. And choosing things like E or H and B and, and uh, I mean, B and, you know what I mean, <laughs> whether you choose the fields or the, uh, the inductions. Uh, choosing these things is one way of trying to take these things into account properly. But you've got to be careful that they do, in fact, take these things into account properly. We understand the microscopic physics, I think. The question is, how to do it without making mistakes. And, and I wish I had an easy answer, and, uh, and, and the, the best answer I could give is be careful. Yes, sir. Uh, that is a general question, sir, uh, by Mr. Uh, Robin. Uh, he asked that, you know, is uh, mankind's innate strive for perfection uh, is uh, at, uh, behind uh, achieving higher precision, or is it purely on scientific consideration? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I have a good answer to that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you see, trying to separate uh, what you might call the human desire for, for perfection or for precision from the scientific uh, questions and limitations, what you can do scientifically is very often determined by how clever the scientist is in coming up with either a good uh, definition or a good technique for realizing that definition. And so I'm not sure that I can separate the, the human element from the, uh, the scientific element in the, the pursuit of, of precision. Uh, they're very closely connected. If it had not been for the genius of somebody like Brian Kibble, we wouldn't uh, uh, be able to make use of this new definition in this particular way. But there's other there's other techniques for using the new definition that don't involve Kibble, but involve other people who have made advances uh, in making accurate measurements of the lattice constant of silicon, for example. That's another way of getting the kilogram using the same definition. So uh, uh, I am always amazed by the, the unending uh, uh, imagination of the human spirit. 
Uh, and so I, I don't think I can separate the, the scientific and the human. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is one last question, sir, uh, by a young uh, researcher, I guess. Miss Juliet uh, says, uh, you know, wants to know, is there a life message that you would like to give young aspirants like that of her? Yes. Uh, my, my advice to, to both young people and to old people is to never lose your curiosity. Curiosity, in my opinion, is the thing that drives scientific research. It's the thing that drives the increase of our knowledge. The fact that we want to understand things better is the thing that continually gives us more and more understanding of nature. I believe that at least for the foreseeable future, which is to say, not just in my lifetime, but in your lifetime as well, we are never going to run out of things to learn about nature. There will be a constant uh, increase of our understanding of nature, and that increase will come because people like you are curious. It's the curious people who will give us that, uh, that understanding. And so my advice to everyone, at every stage of life is stay curious.